blessed Sabbath to each one of you, and we're glad that you're with us today. I'm certainly glad to be here, and I'm thankful for each one who's here today, as well as all of you. Today, our fundamental mentions this, the uh, topic of the millennium. But the main teaching on the millennium, however, comes a little bit later in Fundamentals 24, 26, and 27. This particular fundamental we're going to be talking about really deals with the fact that there's no great world conversion. And so I just want to jump right on in, and uh, we're at fundamental here, number uh, eight, as it were, and as you can see there, at number eight. And so it begins, and it says this, that the doctrine of the world's conversion and a temporal millennium is a fable of these last days calculated to law men into a state of carnal security and cause them to be overtaken by the great day of the Lord as by a thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. That the second coming of Christ is to proceed, not follow the millennium. For until the Lord appears, the papal power with all its abominations is to continue, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. The wheat and tares grow together, Matthew 13, 29, 30, and 39. And evil men and seducers wax worse and worse as the word of God declares, 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 13. So now let's think about this statement, and we're just going to look at it step by step. And the first part of the statement again says that the doctrine of the world's conversion and a temporal millennium is a fable of these last days. So we ask the question, will the world at last be converted? Will the world at last be converted? Now, we're going to be looking at this from the Bible, but I just want to introduce to you one commentator's point on this, just for your thought first. And this is from the book Great Controversy, page 321, paragraph 2. The doctrine of the world's conversion and the spiritual reign of Christ was not held by the apostolic church. It was not generally accepted by Christians until about the beginning of the 18th century. Like every other error, its results were evil. It taught men to look far into the future for the coming of the Lord and prevented them from giving heed to the signs heralding his approach. It induced a feeling of confidence and security that was not well founded and led many to neglect the preparation necessary in order to meet their Lord. So does the Bible really say uh, that the whole world is going to eventually be converted or teach a type of what might be called universalism? universalism. Well, let's just look at some ver various verses, and I suppose as we look at these, we could literally produce hundreds, and I mean that, hundreds of scriptures on this point. I won't belabor you with hundreds, but I'll, I'll certainly give you enough to make it, make it clear. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 14, Jesus said, for many are called, but few are chosen. Not everyone's chosen, you see. In Matthew chapter 20, in verse 16, if you'd like to look at that text, Matthew 20, 16. He says, so the last shall be first and the first last, for many are called, but few chosen. Very similar uh, statement. Again, from Matthew. Matthew was good to collect some of these statements for us. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, he gives us this counsel, he gives us a command. He says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, why didn't Jesus just simply say, all will find it? If the whole world was going to convert, be converted, why didn't he say everyone's going to get there, just some maybe sooner than others? He didn't say that, did he? In fact, a little bit later on in the seventh chapter of Matthew, Jesus says this, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many, now no, he doesn't say all, but many, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then why profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work, what? Iniquity. Anomia. The opposite of keeping the law. Iniquity. 
So Jesus is telling us here that it's not going to be the great majority. It's not going to be everyone, not even a great majority, but rather those who find the way of salvation ultimately are the few. They are the minority. You know, we live in what's called a democracy. It used to be a republic, but sort of a democracy now, yeah. if you know the difference. And in a democracy, majority rules, right? Well, I suppose in the heavenly economy, the majority will rule because we on this earth are a minority in the whole universe. But within this earth, the majority, friends, is almost never right. Remember that. The majority is almost never right. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, he says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus speaks about setting some on his right hand and some on his left hand. And to those on his left hand, he says, you are to depart from me. You are cursed. Does that sound like a, a group of people that are going to be converted? He says, you're to depart into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. And we read a little bit about that fire and the this concept of the millennium in Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 7, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, now there is a thousand year period. There is a millennium, if you please mention the Bible. It's used six times in the book of Revelation chapter 20. We'll look at those a little bit later in a few weeks. But it says, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Continuing in verse 9 and 10 now. And they, that is this group, this Gog and Magog, as they're called, these unbelievers, these who are lost, they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jesus says that this everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. And they're going to be cast into it, but friends, Gog and Magog, those which represent the unbelievers here, those who never accepted Christ, those who rejected Christ, they are going to be also destroyed. They're not going to be universally saved. Now, when I was younger, before I became a Christian, I heard something about this teaching of a world's conversion, a second chance, a, a, a temporal millennium. And I thought, you know, that's just a great thing. I think that's wonderful because I can just live like a devil right now. When the time gets right, I'll get right and get saved and it'll be okay. That's really what I thought. I like that idea. The idea of the world's conversion in a temporal millennium, though, produces wicked fruit. It produces wicked fruit. This is the continuation of the statement that the doctrine of the world's conversion and a temporal millennium is calculated to law men into a state of carnal security and cause them to be overtaken by the great day of the Lord as by a thief in the night. And as I mentioned, when I was younger, I just thought that was a great idea. Why not? Why not? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul there writes, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Why? For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, world's conversion, Temporal millennium, good things to come. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But as we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 here, that when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them, and uh, they are not going to be escape. Now, they're going to be saying peace, peace, right? But I want to tell you something about peace. Jesus does offer peace to his people, and we need to understand that. We can have peace in this world. In John chapter 14 and verse 27, Jesus said, Peace, I leave with you. 
my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You see, friends, when we're living outside of Jesus, we don't have peace. You've seen that, that expression, um, no Jesus, N-O, no Jesus, no N-O, peace. But to K-N-O Jesus is to K-N-O peace, to no peace. It truly is. You know, it was prophesied that Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, would be called the what? The Prince of Peace. And I want to tell you, friends, God does not wish for his children to be in darkness. The Apostle Paul, as we read a little bit ago, he says that that day should not take you unaware. You should not be taken in by this darkness because you're children of light. And God doesn't wish for his children to be in darkness, but darkness substantially is simply the absence of light. You really can't define darkness outside of the absence of light. And Jesus is the light. He says in John chapter 8 and verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am what? The light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus is the true light. And friends, where do we learn about Jesus? We learn about him in his word. In fact, his word, it is as much an extension of him as we can understand. In Psalms 119 and verse 105, there it says, Thy word, the Bible, friends, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's saying the same thing, just in two different ways. But a lamp produces light, you see. We're not to be children of darkness, we're to be children of light. That means we're to be children of the Word of God. We're to know what the Word of God says, friends, about these matters. We are to have the light of Jesus. We're not to be left in darkness. We're not to be left without light. Now, going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where it made reference in the statement. He says in verses 4 and 5, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So God wants us to have light. And furthermore, he wants us to be light. He wants us to be light in this world. Jesus, when he was speaking on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, and verses 14 through 16, he said this, Ye are the light of the world, and ye is second person plural, isn't it? So it's not just one of us, it's all of us. We are to be the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then he commands us in verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so, friends, if we don't have any good works in our life, we're not doing what God wants us to have and to do because he wants us to have good works to shine forth and it will glorify him. Glorify him. But friends, we can only do this if we walk in the light. It's not enough to hear the light. It's not even enough to know about the light. We can have an intellectual knowledge of the light. But we must walk in the light. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 5, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 5, he says, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. We're to walk in the light of the Lord. And in 1 John 1, 7, he says, But if ye walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. So again, it's important, it's imperative, friends, that we walk in the light. The saved, the great saved that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, who have walked in the light in this earth's time, will continue to walk in the light in the future. How do you know that, preacher? Because the Bible says so. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 24, he says, And the nations of them which are saved, that implies there's going to be some that aren't saved, doesn't it? But the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. Oh, friends, I'm thankful for that, aren't you? We're going to be walking in light through all eternity. If we're going to be doing it in the future, we better get used to it right now, hadn't we? You know, before the, the football players go out and play the big Super Bowl game, they do a lot of practice first, right? They get ready for it. 
so that they're ready. Well, we're, friends, we have this time, this probationary time, to be walking in the light and getting ready today. We are not to be slumbering. We're not to be drunken. We're to be wide awake and in the light. Continuing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 now, he says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, what's the fundamental difference between day and night? Light. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. That's what I want. Amen. I hope it's what you want. Well, that fundamental continues, and it says that the second coming of Christ is to proceed, not to follow the millennium. How do we show from the Bible that the second coming of Christ proceeds or comes before the millennium? How do we know this? Well, I'd like to begin by looking at uh, a scripture of Jesus in John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29, because here Jesus mentions two great general resurrections. And we're going to be able to use this information to logically put it into a, a sequence of parts that help us to see the picture clearly. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. He says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of what? Life. Life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of? Damnation. Now, wait a minute. I thought that the whole world was going to get converted. There was going to be a temporal millennium. But according to this verse as well, there's a resurrection of damnation. That doesn't sound like universal salvation to me, does it to you? But again, two great general resurrections. Now, I know the Bible speaks about some specific special resurrections, but two great general resurrections. And the faithful, we learn, are going to be with Christ during that millennium time, that 1,000 years. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, Revelation 20 verse 4, he says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, or the Greek could read, in favor of them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ. How long? A thousand years. So whatever this thousand year period is, the righteous, those who are saved, those who overcame the beast, the mark of the beast in his image, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Let's go now to Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. And I want you to notice that I don't have this on the screen exactly in the format. Words are all the same, but the exact format's in your Bible. I'll explain why. But the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. Now I'm going to stop here for a second. You've got the righteous who are living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. But it says the rest of the dead. Now who would the rest of the dead be? The wicked. Remember, there's two great resurrections. So the rest of the dead, that's the wicked, lived not till a thousand years were finished. Now, if you look in your Bible, you see that verse 5 is not finished yet, as it is in your Bible. It says, this is the first resurrection. But I've put some space there, mm -hmm. and I've taken out the letter 6 to indicate where verse 6 goes, because you need to understand something about the Bible, and that is that most of these chapter divisions and all of the verse divisions were inserted by men. In other words, where do you put verse 2 and verse 3? Where in the sentence, where in the paragraph do you block it off and change it? That is not something that is inspired. The latter part of verse 5 more appropriately goes with the first part of verse 6. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now we read that the righteous live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And they are the part of the first resurrection because the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. And that's the resurrection of damnation. They're not certainly blessed and holy, are they? It's the ones who are raised with with the first resurrection that are blessed and holy, who live and reign with Christ a thousand years. These are the ones who are blessed, they are happy, they are part of the first resurrection, so we just need to know when that's going to be. Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
we learn. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. He says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise, what? Sure. First. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Friends, that first great resurrection happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ, Amen. when the trumpet sounds and Jesus returns. Amen. And that's our hope, friends. That's, the, that's where I want to be. Now, you know, I know some of you don't think I'm getting old yet, but I am getting older. <laughs> and although I'm fighting and kicking against it all the way, it's possible. It's possible. I could die before Jesus comes. I might be walking to my house this afternoon. And as I cross the road, a truck comes through that I didn't see. You know, that happened to me in Peru almost one time. I was in Peru. And um, in Lima. And I was at an intersection or near uh, on a sidewalk. And I just started to step out on the road. And something just said, don't. And I don't know why, but I just hesitated for a second. And, 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 a, and a vehicle went by very fast, right, right in front of me. And I had not seen it in any way. And I don't know how I missed seeing it. But I know that someone was praying for my safety that day. Amen. And because someone was praying for my safety that day, God spared me. But it could happen today. And I would be waiting for that first resurrection. We have loved ones who are waiting for that first resurrection. And I want to be there that day, whether I am uh, uh, of those who are raised first or those who are later called together to meet with the Lord. I want to be there. But the only way I can be sure to be there is to have my relationship with Jesus solid, firm, connected. And friends, you can't have that if you're into iniquity. You can't have that if you're in iniquity because Jesus said that those who do iniquity depart into the resurrection and damnation. We're coming up against some great crisis here on this earth. Yeah. We're seeing this, this COVID-19 thing as a precursor, I believe, to the mark of the beast. We are conditioning people to do what the government says, to take orders, if you please. And, and, and what, I'm, what I'm thinking right now in connection with this, it doesn't have anything to do with whether the vaccination is good or the vaccination is bad. Everybody's got their thoughts on that, and I do too. But the point I'm saying is, is when you mandate something like this and you mandate someone's personal health and their private life, and you can control that, friends, you control about everything else if you want to. Think about it. If people will let you control that, they'll let you control everything else. This second coming of Christ is when he raises the righteous dead. Remember it said in Revelation 20 that they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And Jesus told his disciples before he left, before his crucifixion, before he went back to heaven, he said in John chapter 14, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again and receive you unto myself. And notice the last part, that where I am, there ye may be also. Amen. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Jesus is teaching us that at his second coming, the righteous dead will be raised, and that will be the, the beginning of the millennium. The millennium comes after, not before, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now that fundamental principle statement also has a little line in it that you won't find in a current fundamental principles of Adventism. It says, for until the Lord appears, until the second coming, the papal power with all his abominations is to continue. Mm -hmm. Now I'd just like to say something uh, about the, the Adventist people. The Adventist people have been a people of love. They love everybody. And I hope they even love the Pope. However, we have to understand that sometimes we must make a distinction between people and systems. There are religious systems that God cannot approve of. It doesn't mean he doesn't love the people. In fact, he says in Revelation 18 to those people, he says, come out of her, my people. Speaking about those people in Babylon, he says, come out of my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, you receive not of her plagues. He loves those people, he wants them to come out. 
And the Adventist people love those people who are involved in the papal power, but they don't love the, the system of the papal power because it's abominable and God condemns it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to read some verses here. Verses 3 and 4. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day is making reference to the second coming of Christ. For that day shall not come, except there come a what? Falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is call, called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Oh, this is a lot, man. There's a lot to chew on here, isn't there? But this man of sin, this son of perdition, opposes God, exalts himself above God. Now, you should know something about this expression falling away here. You should know something about it. It's from a Greek word, apostasia, apostasia. And sometimes when we think of apostasy, where we get our word from apostasy, we think of a falling away. And we probably think of that because of the way the King James translators have translated this verse. There's a falling away first. You know, they say, well, you know, you can't go into apostasy unless you originally knew the truth because an apostasy is falling away from the truth. We all heard that. I've even said that. But friends, when we look a little deeper, that really isn't it at all. <laughs> it's worse than that. It's worse than that. Because this word means a defection or a revolt. Revolt. The Lonida Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, based on somatic domain, states this about it. It means to rise up in open defiance of authority with the presumed intention to overthrow it or to act in complete opposition to its demands. That's what the word apostasia means. It doesn't mean simply that you knew the truth, loved the truth, and fell away from the truth. You never had to love the truth at all. You just have to be in rebellion against the truth. You have to be in a revolt against the truth. And in fact, a lot of translations translate it that very way. The new, in uh, English Standard Version, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 says, Let no man deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. There's a rebellion. Well, let's continue in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, now verses 5 and 6. He says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Verse 7 and 8. For the mystery of iniquity, now it's called the mystery of iniquity, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. And, and that's an old English expression for restrain, for who will rest, be restrained. Until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So friends, we have this man of sin or lawlessness, the son of perdition. Perdition means destruction or death. The mystery of iniquity. We have that wicked. He's called that wicked. And he says, God, who is the restrainer, will hold the evil in check and will continue to restrain until the time comes for the mystery of iniquity to be revealed and then finally taken out of the way. And that's where we're at today, friends. That's where we're at today. Now, in this statement that we looked at earlier, it speaks about the papal power and its abominations. And yet, this is not the main fundamental statement on the papacy. That comes later. But if you look through all of the fundamental statements that are currently believed by the Seventh-day Adventists, how many of those fundamentals, how many of those 28 mention the papacy? Zero. Zero. How many tell us what the mark of the beast is? Zero. Zero. And it makes me think of this statement that was written by a very wise person in Signs of the Times of February 19, 1894, paragraph 4. It is the rejection of Bible truth which makes men approach to infidelity. It is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Think about that. Now again, we're going to look at this in detail later. We're going to expose from the Bible who this man of sin is and why the Bible can identify the papacy as the man of sin. We're going to do that from the Bible alone. 
We'll use some history with it too, the fulfillment of certain things. But we'll show that, but that comes in another um, time when we look at fundamental 13. Now this statement that we were looking at though today, on no world's conversion, it finishes by saying that the wheat and the tare grow together, Matthew 13, 29, 30, and 39. And evil man and seducers wax worse and worse as the word of God declares, 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 13. So it's mentioning here what we commonly call the parable, the wheat and the tares, right? The wheat and the tares. But you know, the Bible calls it the parable, the tares of the field. The Bible refers to it as the parable, the tares of the field. And we'll see that in a little bit. But let's read that parable. Let's read it. Matthew 13, verses 24 through 26. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Continuing verse 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, least while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. And Jesus said, Let both grow together into the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, friends, again, there certainly is no world conversion taught here. There's going to be wheat and there's going to be tares. Some are going to be gathered into the heavenly barn and some are going to be gathered to be burned. How shall we understand this parable? Well, in verse 36 of, of Matthew 13, it says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went to the house. So he just finished his teaching. He sends the people away. He goes in the house. But his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And I have declare here, you see, with a little gold box behind it here. And that's just to remind me that this is an imperative statement in the Greek. It's an imperative statement in the Greek. The disciples are almost, as it were, demanding of Jesus. You've got to tell us. I mean, this is as close as the disciples ever come to just demanding something from Jesus Christ. Declare unto us this parable. And, uh, and so Jesus does. In verse 37, he begins. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Jesus himself. The field is the world. You remember on the old Review and Herald mastheads, they used to have a picture of a globe, and underneath they said, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. And then continuing in verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom, what? all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. Now it's interesting that the word offend, the word offend is the Greek word scandalon. Scandalon. We get an English word scandal from this. But it doesn't mean scandal in the sense that we commonly think of scandal, but as you notice from the di dictionary definition, it is a stick for bait or of a trap, generally a snare or a stumbling block. Again, the Lonida Dictionary declares that scandalon is that which or that which or one who causes someone to sin, that which causes someone to sin, one who causes someone to sin. The idea is it's something that produces sin. Something that produces sin. So he says back here that Jesus, the Son of Man, shall send forth these angels, and those angels are going to gather out of his kingdom not only them which do iniquity, but all things that cause iniquity, all things that cause people to sin. 
That's right. Well, I should tell you about something that I think is a scandal on. And it's happening next week. It's happening next week. Under the title of One Step Closer, the Central States Regional Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is advertising an ordination ceremony oh, yes. for October the 23rd next week for Kimberly, and I may be pronouncing her name wrong, I'll try to say as best, but I think it's uh, Bulgin, Bulgin, who is, quote, pastor of the New Beginnings SDA Church in Wichita, Kansas. And again, she's supposed to be ordained next week. Well, you should understand something about Miss Kimberly, Pastor Kimberly. She has her own website, um, and she talks about being set free. It's all about women's freedom and being set free. And in fact, she's having a, a retreat, a retreat in some, some Caribbean place where you can come and spend thousands of dollars and, you know, practice learning freedom from all the girls. Um, she has on her website a prayer to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please free me of all sexual shame. In other words, whatever you want to do in, in this line, there's never to be shame in it. It doesn't matter what it is. If you do it right, there's no shame in it. She has something she calls naked truth. And the naked truth says, if the church makes you ashamed of showing your butt, hips, thighs, cleavage, knees or armpits, they were wrong. And when you take your cursor and wand over that little block, you have this other come up over here. And it says, honey, let God arise and his enemies be scattered, okay? Can you just imagine? On this International Women's Day, it's a good day to be reminded that your body was never meant to be weaponized as a tool for control or fear in the church. Don't let church folk have you out there thinking that your body is a problem to be dealt with rather than a body to be celebrated. Be set free to let the Spirit lead you on your choice of clothing that honors God and your body, period. Be set free. Love God, love sex. Um, I could show you more things that came from this website, but I couldn't because I would be ashamed and too embarrassed. There are things here that, that I would think a husband and wife would be ashamed to even show his, their mate. It's so bad. I'm going to tell you something, friends. This is one of those kind of things that offends. Yes, they said one step closer. This is one step closer to rebellion and stumbling blocks for sincere believers. But what can we expect coming from an organization where we have been told, where the prophecy is, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built in the sand, and storm and tempters would sweep away the structure. Yes, beloved, all things that offend God and cause God shame shall be gathered out. What will happen to those who do iniquity? Let's read it a little bit more. We've read it before, but we're going to read it again. Again, continuing. Matthew 13, 42, continuing. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of people who haven't heard. And they're not hearing. And they're just practicing abominations. And God says he's going to send his angels. And they're going to gather together everything that is a scandal. And everything that causes sin. And all those who do iniquity. And they are going to be cast into a lake of fire. And there will certainly be gnashing of teeth. Beloved, the doctrine of the world's conversion... And a temporal millennium is certainly a fable of these last days. The words of Jesus tell us that instead of all the world being saved, the most, in fact, many, the most, will be lost. While Jesus said the road is narrow. Now, don't miss this. If you don't get anything else, don't miss this. While Jesus said the road is narrow, it's broad enough for everyone who wants to get on. It's like when that boat, that famous boat, the Titanic, sank. Some of those lifeboats, most of those lifeboats left, not full. But there were some that were getting full near the end. And there was only room for so many. And when those boats were in the water, some of those people who were in the water tried to swim and got it. And some did get in the boats and some couldn't get in the boats. 
There just wasn't enough room for everyone. But although the road is narrow and the, and, and, and the gate is straight, friends, there's enough room for everyone. It's wide enough for everyone who wants to get on. And I want to be on that, don't you? Amen. Jesus certainly wants you on that. He says in John 6, 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That can be you. It can be me, beloved. We all have that opportunity. We can come to Jesus, friends, just as we are. But the good news is we don't leave just as we are. We can come to him sinful, polluted, and, 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 and terrible. But friends, we can leave pure, holy, undefiled, and obedient people. We come as in disobedience, but we can leave in obedience. And praise the Lord, friends, that he will heal and he will cleanse his people. Jesus is coming soon. And the papacy and her allies want to put you to sleep thinking that things are far, far off into the future. Often Satan does not say, don't come to Jesus. Did you realize that? Satan doesn't always, in fact, usually he doesn't say don't come to Jesus. He just says, do it later. Do it later. This is probably even a good idea. Just do it later. But friends, later is too late. Later will be too late. We are to come to Jesus today just as we are. As the fundamental concluded in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And in verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Beloved, God wants us to be children of the light. Right? Not children of the darkness. Children of the day, not children of the night. We need not be deceived. Amen. We can be children of the light, but only as we know, receive and walk in the light. And I urge you today, friends, to repent of your sins, to walk in the light today. For now, today, is the day of salvation. I don't know what it's going to be like in that end time exactly. None of us have, have lived through it yet. But certainly we have a, a pretty good preview. And Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah and Lot, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And what was it like in the days of Noah? You can just imagine, people heard Noah preaching, right? They heard him preaching. And, and, and there were probably people who were convicted in their hearts. And, and, and maybe there were some wives who went to their husbands and said, you know, I believe Noah's true, and we've got to get on the ark. And the husband said, well, look, honey, you know, it's never rained. I checked with CNN, and, 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 and the weather reporter there says it's never been anything but sunshine all the days of this earth's history. And I talked to, 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 to the science guy, Bill Nye, the other day, and he says it's just an impossibility for it to rain. It can't happen. So I, I think you just need to calm down about this fanatical idea, right? You can see in your mind eye, but then what happens? The rain comes, and the guy says, oh, oh, wife, you were right. Let's go. Let's get to the ark quickly. But the door is shut. The door is shut. And probation is going to close when humanity least suspects it. And Jesus is going to throw down the censer. And he's going to say, he that is just, let him be just still. And he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And every case will be eternally decided, irrevocably decided, never to be changed. We think that we'll have another day. How many students started the college thinking, I'm going to finish this degree, and it never got done? And they say, well, you know, I'll go back to school. They drop out for whatever reason. I'm going to go back to school. I'll get my degree someday. And, you know, about 99% of them never do. Never do. This is far more important than an education. It is, in a sense, an education.
But it's not of the world. It's of heaven. And God wants you in his kingdom, friends. I cannot emphasize how much God wants you. How do I know that? How do you know, preacher, God really wants me in his kingdom? Because the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's you. God wants you in his kingdom. I was talking with someone recently and they were telling me about how that they had uh, moved to another state for a while and they just decided they were going to live however they wanted and they were going to get away from God. And after doing that for 10 or 11 years, they saw the folly of it and they came back to the Lord. And I praise God for that individual. But friends, that individual is probably the exception, not the rule. We need to act upon what we have today. Today is the day of salvation. Don't let the sun set upon you today if you've not made everything right with Jesus, friends. That's my prayer for you. And may God bless you lots and lots and lots.